Good morning. And welcome to the final Plants, Pests, and Pathogens of 2010. I'm delighted you've uh, joined us this morning. This is Lucy Bradley. I'm the Urban Horticulture Specialist here at NC State and delighted to be working with you on this program. Um, if you haven't already done an audio setup, please go up to the, the tools bar and click on audio setup and follow this audio wizard guide to, to get in your mic set. Uh, quick reminder that everything that you type in the chat box is visible to all the moderators. Uh, even if you say if you select to send it to one person, the moderators see it. So there's no privacy on, on Illuminate. Um, please leave your microphone button turned off unless you are actually speaking to ask a question. That'll cut down on the feedback and um, background noise that we have. The microphone button is in the bottom left corner. It's gray when it's off and it's yellow when it's on. We are recording this session and it'll be available online um, for you to check back again. And just a uh, request to the agents that you register for LMS so that you can get continuing ed credit for participating in this program. Okay. So who's here today? Right up here on the, let's see, on, on your bar there's a magic wand that you can click. If you click that, then you can click where you are and, and put a point on the on the map. So would you guys just quickly put a point showing us where you are so we have a sense of the representation here today. We got Haywood County's represented, McDowell, Burke, Pitt. Okay. So we got from one side of the state to the other side. <laughs> Somebody Somebody's way up here and, and down here too. Okay, great. <laughs> that must be Seth. I'm not sure where he is this morning. Uh, we have a website that's got all the information and background information about the Plants, Pests, and Pathogens program. If, if you, here's the tiny URL. It's tiny.cc forward slash ZRM81. Takes you to this page which has got all the handouts from previous sessions and the schedules. It's got um, information on Illuminate and how to work that. All kinds of, of, of resource information here to help you get more out of this program and for us to capture it so that you can use it later. If there's other things that would be useful to include in this site, please let me know because um, that's what it's for is, to, is to, to make it easier for you to participate and for you to get more out of it. Got a great program lined up today. Um, we got Agent Insights, uh, Julie Shirk will be our featured speaker on edible landscaping and then we'll have our, our current insects and what's happening in diseases at, at, the, at the end. Lee J. Hicks is our amazing technologist who keeps us all uh, functioning and gets everybody on board. Lee J., do you want to, to let me welcome you and, and give you a chance to say a few words? Good morning, everyone. This is Lee J. Um, you know, I think that you all know the drill by now. Um, if you don't have a mic, I know there are quite a few people that say they don't have a mic. You're not, you know, um, alone, and you can participate in the chat window. So definitely, if you have a question, type it in there. Um, and if one of our presenters doesn't see it, Lucy and I will poke them and make sure that they recognize your question. Um, other than that, if you have a question for me, type it in the chat box. Back to you, Liz. Thanks, Lee Jay. Our first presenter today is, is Tom Glasgow. Tom is a horticulture extension agent and the county director for Craven County. Uh, he's also he's an accomplished accomplish. pianist. <laughs> Tom. I can see that Tom's mic is on, but yeah. I'm not hearing him. Tom, um, you might want to make sure that your mute button is not pressed on your headset. Sometimes that's a problem. Okay, how about now? Perfect. Okay. All right. Well, if you've got my pictures, I'll just walk through those real fast and get out of the way for somebody else. Okay, um, go back to the first one. 
Yeah, just the next, um, go one more. There we go. Uh, this was an, uh, an incident we had um, a few months ago. We have a demonstration vegetable garden on site. And in fact, we've had it about 20 years. And I noticed a, a pile of manure and, and bedding or sawdust in the parking lot. It made me a little nervous, especially when I noticed flies swarming over the uh, pile. And then I started looking into the garden and saw, as you can see in this picture, that this material had been put throughout the entire garden. And the uh, produce from this garden, and this goes back 20 years, has been on a weekly basis, year-round, delivered to soup kitchens and uh, low-income assisted living places and other people in need. And so the, the issue was, did we have a situation here that was getting outside uh, currently accepted standards? And if you can go to the next slide, uh, you can see we, we've got uh, one of the problems here, obviously, was that it was applied on a crop that was already planted. And we had heavy rains uh, a week or so after uh, the material was applied, which kind of raises the specter of splashing of, of the material on vegetation and so forth. If you can go another slide, um, just another view of the garden and a reminder of just how much rainfall we had back in uh, September. Uh, advance another slide, please. And that's a, just a, more of an aspect of the garden. And one of the things that I found as I began consulting with other agents, and, and other agents that were, a, were a huge help for me in this, um, trying to sort through what do we do next. But even if you have taller growing crops, like you can see some peppers uh, in the background there, that's not considered safe either because of the possibility of splashing rain, moving stuff around. Um, uh, it, it doesn't have to be just something sitting on the ground that you're concerned about. Uh, we have just a couple more of these manure slides, if you can go to the next one. And you can see actual clods of manure mixed in there with the sawdust. So the premise of the folks who were doing this project was that this was aged, it was properly composted, and I and the other folks who inspected this pile came to the conclusion it wasn't even close. As it was explained to me by a regional uh, NCBA agronomist who helped also with this, if it's finished, it should be consistent color, consistent text, uh, texture, um, no odor, certainly no visible clods of manure. So this was just totally, totally inappropriate. If we can go to one more slide, I think it's the last one of these. No, I'm sorry, back up. Um, two problems were identified then to conclude. First of all, the material was not remotely finished and composted. And secondly, it was applied to a, a crop that was already in the ground. At a minimum, this material should have been composted into the ground 120 days before anything was planted. And then you could maybe justify continuing with it as a, as a harvest and distribution situation. Uh, we had some hard feelings. The uh, volunteers did not agree at all. And they ended up shutting the garden down completely and leaving the site. But we were in a position, since this was county property, we had no choice. And we had to step in and say, there's no way we can allow this to be harvested and passed around to people um, representing county property, representing NC State, et cetera. So that was. Um, little episode we had this fall, one point I'd make to conclude is we are, in fact, dealing with a lot of folks out there who uh, take organic gardening as a point of pride. And they certainly um, are almost religious about not applying any pesticides, but take a very dismissive view of the risk of um, um, handling of manure and safe handling practices. Uh, go ahead. Somebody needed to Oh, one minute left. Uh, Lantana, probably not drought damage. We uh, get questions about what's going on with the Lantana down here. If you see this, Lantana is extremely tough, even invasive in places like Florida. Not likely to be 
drought damage at all. If you go to the next slide, you see the uh, Lantana lace bug. Just a reminder, very, very widespread problem down here. Lantana is so tough uh, that that's not likely to be a drought damage situation. Last picture coming up, and I'll get out of the way. Um, the Matrix Morpheus pansy that I saw at the J.C. Ralston Arboretum last week, just beautiful, just a reminder to um, get out and visit the Arboretum over the winter months, and that's it. Okay, I guess I'm up. Everybody hear me all right? I'll assume so. Okay, I'm Paul McKenzie uh, with the uh, uh, Vance County and Warren County Cooperative Extension offices, and uh, wanted to give a, uh, a highlight of a project that my master gardeners have been working on uh, in a collaboration with the 4-H, and, and this is my outline. You can kind of follow along here. Uh, uh, basically, this is a, a plant and soil lessons for third graders, and we've been using the soil solutions curriculum. Um, we've uh, collaborated with 4-H and a couple of schools to deliver four 90-minute lessons on plants and soils, and we've been using the soil solutions curriculum, uh, which is based on the North Carolina Standard Course of Study, so it fits in nicely with the, with the schools. Uh, we space those lessons throughout the school year. We have four visits to each classroom. Um, this would be a project that could be duplicated around the state fairly easily. Uh, Liz uh, Driscoll in the NC State Horticulture Department uh, has that soil solutions curriculum. Uh, your 4-H agent may also have that. Uh, you just need to find, in our case, we went with a third grade teacher, and uh, we found it helpful to do kind of a sample lesson just to make sure that the teacher knew what they were getting on board with and that uh, we felt like we had a good working relationship with the, with the teacher before we made that commitment. Um, as far as the logistics of this, uh, we formed a team, and uh, I'll give you a little bit more about that below. And uh, I'm not quite sure how to scroll down on this, if maybe somebody can do that for me. Um, uh, at, at your first team meeting, uh, you, you plan your lesson. Uh, you need to have a, we found you need to have a second mes uh, meeting to prepare the lesson, compile your supplies. Then you go and deliver the lesson and just repeat that for each of the four times. So it's quite a bit of work uh, for delivering each of those lessons. And anybody who's been a teacher can relate to uh, uh, the amount of work involved in lesson planning. Um, oh, here we go, scrolling down. OK. Um, as far as the team, uh, we found a, a strong leader from among our Master Gardener volunteers to serve as the coordinator. And that's important because it's, it's really a lot to put on uh, an agent to be the leader for this type of project. Uh, agents get pulled in so many different directions. Uh, so a good, strong Master Gardener leader, five or six additional Master Gardeners, and then you need a good collaboration between the 4-H agent and the, the horticulture agent. Uh, why did we do four lessons? Uh, this came from our 4-H agent, Pam Jones, uh, who's been doing a tremendous job with this, and also Aaron Bain in uh, Warren County. Uh, the 4-H uh, program needs six contact hours for their reporting, and also research base has shown that's what's needed to really have an impact. Uh, we chose these four lessons, parts of a seed, germination, parts of a flower, uh, soil properties, and compost recycling. So again, we're going to that same class four times over the year, uh, coming back each time with a new lesson that fits in with their standard course of study. For each lesson, we start out with kind of an introduction to the concepts that we'll be teaching, and we usually try to pick a limited number of very simple concepts related to the lesson. And uh, we try to use models and posters. Uh, you're not going to find you know, PowerPoint uh, equipment in a lot of the classrooms. Um, but we try to do models and posters that we prepare beforehand. Then we break into small groups with the kids four to six students per group, and do a hands-on activity. And, and that's the key to this, is making it a hands-on lesson. So for example, 
with the germination, we put uh, uh, potting mix and annual ryegrass rye seed into a knee high, a woman's knee high pantyhose type thing, and uh, you put that on in a paper cup, and the 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 annual ryegrass sprouts, and it looks like a head with hair coming out of the top, and it's fun, and the kids get get that hands on and, and see the results. Just some general observations. We found you need about six people, six master gardeners or adults per 25 students. That gives you your four group leaders and then two floaters to kind of uh, wander around and keep supplies up. Uh, we found student behavior is generally not an issue when you come into a classroom and you've got six or eight adults. Uh, it's very easy to monitor student behavior and they're getting such good positive attention that uh, there's very little, if any, acting out. Uh, we always wear, wear our red Master Gardener shirts that we use here in our, in our program. That gives us an identity and a presence. The kids recognize us. They look forward. They're excited when they see us coming down the hall. And again, third grade was chosen just because of that uh, tie-in to the North Carolina Standard Course of Study. So it's really been an exciting program for us. We've had a lot of excitement and enthusiasm around it. Uh, Master Gardeners love spending time with the kids. The kids love it when we come. Uh, so it's just been a real success and we're hoping we might be able to expand it in the future. Right now we're working with two schools and we may try to expand that in the future. So thanks so much. I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Okay, uh, this is Tim Matthews out in Haywood County. Um, what I wanted to do this morning was also to um, preview, um, and I went to the wrong slide here, just a second, uh, to preview one of our programs here with uh, our Master Gardener group. Tim, I'll go ahead and yeah. find your slide. Okay, thanks. Um, but what I'd like to talk to you about is the uh, Haywood County School Garden Programs, um, as soon as we get to that slide. Okay, so here we are. Um, in 2002, I received a call from a couple of teachers who had started a garden uh, at Junaluska Elementary School. Um, they were needing help. Uh, they had got bitten off more than they could chew. So uh, when I got there, this is uh, what we found. They had an area that had been uh, tilled up and uh, basically landscape timbers placed around to uh, form the boundaries of their garden. Uh, this was a first and second grade combination class, and um, so um, a really good setup because the uh, the garden was right outside of their classroom where the kids could come out uh, to the garden. Uh, but again, the teachers just didn't know what what they were doing. They they had gotten started and needed a little help. So went out. This is what I found, and my suggestion uh, to the teachers. Uh, were to allow me to get some of my master gardeners involved and to see what type of a program we could come up with uh, put together for the children of those classes. So um, the master gardeners uh, came. We started to meet with uh, uh, the students. We broke them into four groups, brought them out about um, 12 students at a time. Um, it was myself, five other master gardeners, and we would come once a week work with the students for uh, about two hours, um, and uh, but we uh, found that we had some problems. One of the problems were that the students would uh, walk in the garden, carry the dirt inside um, on their feet. Um, there was no real structure to the program. It was just, we were just flying by the seat of our pants, um, deciding on the spot what we'd do. So. Um, after that year, we got together and we came up with a game plan on how to improve uh, this gardening experience for both the students, uh, the teachers, and the master gardeners as well. So what we decided to do, uh, we decided to install raised beds and mulch heavily around those beds to, uh, to do away with the problem of carrying the dirt in the room. And the master gardeners also put together some programs, much like, like the last speaker uh, talked about. We put together a structured program so when the kids came into the garden, uh, we knew what we were going to do, and um, and so it ran a whole lot smoother. 
uh, we actually applied for a grant, a local grant, and got the materials to uh, install these raised beds. Um, we were also able to purchase uh, a compost bin and some tools for the children to use uh, while they were working in the garden. Uh, this is um, the arrangement. We came up with the beds, came up with four different beds. They're about a foot and a half uh, off the ground, heavily mulched around, um, made it a lot easier for the kids to uh, uh, to reach reach in and, and work the garden. By this time, we had more master gardeners showing interest in the program. Uh, so as our volunteer um, base grew, we were also able to expand our efforts in the garden. Um, and as you see here, we went back to uh, just digging into dirt, basically. Um, we moved outside the boundaries of the, the existing fence that was there. And um, it just really seemed like the, the kids enjoyed digging in the dirt, uh, as well as our master gardeners. <coughs> In 2005, one of our original master gardeners uh, uh, that started this program, you see her here, she passed away. And her family designated the gifts, uh, any gifts to go to support the garden. Um, so we were able to, again, expand their garden. And so here you see um, the beginnings of what we called the Libby Litchfield Memorial Garden at Junaluska School. Um, as you can see, this garden uh, quite a bit larger um, than what we had to uh, begin with. Here's another picture of that. And then in 2007, uh, the students were able to begin planting in this garden. Um, and at this point, our, our volunteer crew out there has grown to uh, more than 15 volunteers at this garden alone. So. Um, as a part of our garden program, we don't just do the garden. We also, uh, at the end of each year, we have what we call a, uh, a harvest meal. Our master gardeners actually uh, bring in a demonstration table, um, demonstrate can, to the children. Somebody you need, have a question? Uh, we'll, we need you to run through the, these last pretty quickly so we can finish up. OK, I was just waiting for the one minute there. OK, so anyway, they uh, actually do that. We have some issues in the garden with uh, insects. Of course, all these are uh, uh, great uh, teaching experiences. We have also started on another garden at uh, Hazelwood. Um, composting is always a big part of our programs. Uh, they've constructed these bins. Also, what we like to do is have the kids do their own journaling. Uh, this gets them in a good habit of keeping records for the future. And um, and they also keep a small journal themselves. The teachers are starting to use the information that they use, that we use in the garden in the classroom. So that's uh, uh, been a real big deal for us. So uh, with that, I will just say thank you and turn it over to the next speaker. Thanks, Tim. Our feature speaker this morning is Julie Shirk. Julie is a landscape architect and an assistant professor here in the Department of Horticulture. She's in the landscape design program. Her passion is to help people create natural spaces and to, to enhance the health of, of the community and the environment. Julie's going to be speaking on edible landscaping. Julie? Yes. <clears throat> yes, good morning. I'm very excited to be here to tell, talk to you all about edible plants and people spaces, connecting people and their food, the why, what, and how to do it. Um, I really appreciated Tom's uh, talk on food safety. Um, and as a landscape architect, we are based uh, our work in the health, safety, and welfare of the community. Lija, am I, are my slides on? There we go. So I have a, a group of slides here that uh, have images from all over, books, uh, my own photographs, websites, um, all to illustrate this idea of edible, edible plants and people spaces. OK, let me just get used to this system here. OK, so why do we do edible landscapes? Well, you just saw a beautiful example for Tim's um, school in Junaluska that really explains it beautifully. It creates community, but um, also it supports a healthy, engaged community. And it uh, provides sustenance. Um, 
It enhances the natural, the rich natural beauty, um, satisfies the need uh, to nurture uh, plant, plant material. Um, it, al it also allows for self-sufficiency, and, and these days that says a lot. So at this first portion, I'm going to go over health, uh, a little bit about history, uh, future, um, some innovative practices, and some basic cultural practices. Um, at the top of the slide here, you see um, the uh, Renoir's beautiful painting of his own garden. And um, artists, and we all sort of are inspired spiritually by these beautiful spaces that we create, um, like the Junaleska School. Um, we have literally designed health uh, out of our, our, our environment. Um, we we are lack food literacy, and we lack the ability to move around. So here's a couple of slides from the uh, CDC that show the epidemic of um, the alarming health, um, not only to you know our health, but also to the um, economic impact. Um, so. We know all these reasons uh, for why we should um, be eating healthier and moving more. Um, so just a little bit about history and beginning with um, 430 million years ago when we domesticated uh, plants that uh, provide us grains and foods, or the question is, did they domesticate us? Um, moving through quickly uh, through history to the Paradise Garden. And when we begin to see a walled garden, and uh, if you look to the smaller images to the right, you can see the four sections that, are, that represent wine, honey, milk, and water um, that we see uh, in the uh, Paradise Gardens. And here, you know, in our spiritual and, and uh, religious history, we see the, the planted Garden of Eden. All these things are part of who we are, part of our, our heritage, part of our history. Um, the Italian uh, Renaissance uh, shows that we used plants at this point to create spaces. Um, so we're beginning to see the use of edible plants to create people spaces uh, in a more deliberate way in the Italian Renaissance. Um, of course, the Jeffersonian agricultural, um, he believed that the yeoman farmer was the backbone of the American economy. More reasons why these edible landscapes are so integrated in our, our history. Um, during the, the Victory Gardens era, uh, where e Eleanor Roosevelt you know, urged us to get out there and, and, and create these gardens. And we ended up with 21 million gardens, which produce 40% of all US vegetables. Um, pretty impressive in 1943. Quickly moving to some more current trends in edible landscapes, permaculture, the organic gardening movement. And here you see some images of the tree fruit guilds, a combination of the, the fruit trees and the either clover for nitrogen fixing or the lavender to help hold moisture. Um, and there's Prince Charles, who's also known for his organic movement. To our White House, very exciting um, opportunity for edible landscapes to be featured in our you know, main residence. Um, very exciting to see that and, and promoting the idea that gardening is good for you. Um, but we've looked to the future, too. Uh, our design, the design world is completely um, inundated currently with all these futuristic images, although the image you see here is one from 1962, where they envisioned this gravity-creating uh, ship that um, at, you know, showed the wonderful uh, wind-blown tree to the right and the patio with the uh, pots and, and the growies all over the, the, this, this uh, spaceship. Um, so from that to current designers that are, in a, are, that are trying to create some ideas about how to grow plants in, in architecture and, and increase our green spaces. Um, I love this next slide that shows the harvesting of these gardens with uh, people in lab coats. Um, so they're nice, clean, white lab coats doing the composting here below on the right and the water recirculation. So a very clever and um, uh, creative way of, of thinking about the future. But it's actually come true. Um, 
we're, we have g giant greenhouse production. Uh, for example, the one uh, in here uh, shown in the New York Times, where 500,000 plants in a backyard farm that provided local, flavorful tomato tomatoes year-round. So we are seeing them actually these true um, practices being implemented. Another hot topic in um, in design currently are these vertical landscapes, um, and they do include edibles. Um, uh, although many of our gardens and what I would like to talk about today include both edibles and um, ornamentals being used together. Um, these more urban, and you see these more in, in very dense urban environments where green space is actually at a premium. Um, the catch is that they're complicated, complicated to build, complicated to uh, maintain and to manage, um, and expensive, expensive structures to, to, uh, to, to take on. A little less high tech. Um, Window farms, and we see these are from images from a New York user who's created these uh, water systems that drip down from one to the other, and very simple, and uh, hanging in windows so that uh, you know south-facing windows. So from from very complex to the very simple, uh, a whole variety. And I think that's a theme about uh, that we should consider when we think about edible landscapes in urban and suburban. Um, landscapes. Um, here we have an example where they just put sweet potatoes on the roof just to add, act as a heat sink, not necessarily as a productive landscape. Um, and also the beautiful ornamental landscape, um, and then the famous Chicago City Hall rooftop. Um, these you know, support reducing the heat island effect and increasing um, the higher quality of air air quality. Um, my students this summer, I co-taught a class and the favorite project, bar none, and we did a whole variety on a, on a planting workshop, was this uh, rooftop garden in the middle of Raleigh um, on, on Fayetteville Street. And the students took a project and designed an ornamental edible landscape. And here are some images um, uh, complete with a Photoshop image of the client's child <laughs> walking in his new garden um, as they're watering their edibles. Uh, so bar none, it was the favorite uh, project for, of the students. Hot topic. Um, so you all are all experts at, at the soil, but um, as we heard earlier this morning, um, the importance of um, being safe with providing good composted soil, um, whether it's in a pot or in a, in a planting bed. Um, and then the idea of incorporating uh, composting in our designs um, as well. Y'all are all, I'm sure, well versed on uh, sun angles. So um, these are some images from a project I did for a client who had to be convinced that she could have um, a kitchen garden on the, on the north side of the structure. So here, uh, just an example, the top one showing um, the, the, the summer solstice, uh, the middle is more of a, you know, a spring fall, and then the last one showing the winter solstice. So proving to her that we could have um, a garden there. Next big topic, water and drainage. Um, so you know, how many barrels will it truly take to actually water a garden? We typically end up with a large cistern. And that's what we're seeing more and more, um, these large cisterns going in underground to, to um, capture water, uh, provided local uh, ordinance uh, allow it. Um, plant varieties. So choosing plant varieties and, and understanding that um, what you see growing in a pot on a deck may not look exactly like it would um, in the field. Uh, so you have the, the squash here growing in the little container, which will never get to the size that you, you see in the, in the um, you know, larger field. And also, the, the picture here of the gourd showing that, yes, the gourds are gorgeous here, but the actual vine is, is past. And sometimes the, those gardens aren't as, as uh, aesthetic as we, we envision them. Um, so what, what are exactly our edible landscapes? Well, I define them as the deliberate layout or, or design of edible plants in the landscape that are beautiful, productive, and create a sense of, of space. So I'm just going to go through some examples of just 
productive landscapes, an ornamental one, and then a set, and how they create a sense of space. Um, the gardens, and to me, they're beautiful. Could be as simple as just getting community out and using bathtubs, tires, sacks, whatever it takes um, to have good, clean, uh, 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 well-developed soil to uh, support the plant growth. Um, it could also be ornamental pots with um, edibles that are um, combined you know, right there outside your front door. I love the example on the right here of the little bag where you grow your lettuce in this little tiny bag and harvest it. Um, the hanging tomatoes above that, um, again, using the tire uh, to grow your lettuces and your pansies. Um, so just, just being creative with what you have. This is a wonderful shot, the, the pickup truck. Uh, so this fellow drives around to find the sunshine in a very urban environment. Um, and these are very, very urban environments where they create these um, sock, uh, soil-filled socks and, 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 and capture water off of the building to water them. So being creative in that urban environment, um, just a, a, a real rage of this resurgence of wanting to grow edibles. Um, of course, community gardens um, that are you know, just rich and, and beautiful and, and create this, this idea of a healthy community. Um, an interesting um, example of sort of a high-tech connection to food is this application for cell phones where you can um, upload um, and allow people to come to your trees and harvest uh, from you know, give permission for folks to come into your property and harvest from your trees. And here's an application of how to do that. So all aspects of um, of edibles in the landscape. Um, so that finally, the, what I'd like to focus on more is the ornamental aspects of a defined um, space that is comfortable and useful for uh, growing edibles. Um, and the idea that you can use this to create artful areas that, that create a sense of space. Here the white uh, chair in front of this uh, arbor structure with hops growing in it um, and having these, these ideas. So um, just rushing through so I can cover everything and give some time for, for questions. Our final section here on how we create edible landscapes, um, we're going to quickly go through plant selection, which I know you all are experts at, um, design principles, design elements, just a little bit about layout, um, and just thinking about landscape plant uses, um, not just using ornamentals, but replacing some of those ideas with edibles. like for borders, hedging, um, barriers, screens, windbreaks, foundation plantings, um, massing or groupings. That these are the elements that we use um, in defining landscapes. So just um, some of my recent finds that my colleagues have shared with me or lectures that I've been to recently. Um, um, of course, I have to give a plug for Miss Lucy Bradley and her beautiful work here uh, as a resource here at NC State. Um, but all kinds of, of um, websites and opportunities to connect uh, with people who are creating plant lists and, and, and creating um, edibles for us. And I, brought, I, I wanted to highlight some in particular, this Native Edibles, um, Michael McCock. McConkey uh, with the Edible Landscaping Nursery in Virginia uh, just gave a talk here at the Botanical Garden and he covered some wonderful uh, plants like the hardy kiwi that you see here um, at the top right corner growing on a second floor balcony in my neighborhood. I don't know if you can make out from that light, but there are all kinds of little kiwis hanging on there. Um, the prickly pear, the, uh, the elderberry, uh, which is also a wetland plant, which is another hot top topic. Um, the chinquapin bush that um, creates you know, you know, a wonderful shrub that you could um, include in a landscape. Um, so trying to address all aspects of, of gardening from using large trees like pecans to, or persimmons or mulberries to smaller materials um, like uh, brambles like the raspberries and blackberries. So this is a wonderful list um, and a wonderful resource for these um, native edibles. Um, 
Frank Hyman here, a local um, designer who, uh, and, and nurseryman who uh, gave a talk on perennial edibles, um, I had no idea that the Solomon seal was completely edible. Uh, the leaves before they open, the shoots are edible. The flowers are edible, the berries, even the root. Uh, so it's a delight to see a shade uh, plant that is also edible. Um, asparagus, of course, the beautiful artichoke, the sunchokes, and then the ostrich fern fiddleheads that are, are so um, creative and, and tasty. Um, just some easy container vegetables um, or, or our annual um, edibles. Um, just a, a quick list here, um, and I'm sure there are plenty others, um, and how beautiful the, 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 the foliage and the, the actual uh, crops are. Um, and finally, a list of herbs, and uh, of course, not inc completely inclusive, but I wanted to show this slide because herbs are wonderful for creating form um, in our landscape. So this bed is edged with thyme, and then you see the parsley and the, I believe it's uh, 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 sage uh, or basil. Um, so just jumping into uh, design design uh, principles. And we have to think about how to fit the site and the individual's needs with what we, we promote. So we look at um, texture, form, and color. Um, and texture ranges from coarse with very large leaves or flowers to very fine with small leaves or flowers. And they come in, um, these edibles come in various sizes, like I mentioned the large trees, um, large, medium, and small trees, shrubs, and ground covers. Um, the other aspect is, and you can see here in the beautiful variety of colors in this choices that I've, I've given, um, and form. So uh, some plants are V-shaped or round or oval or columnar. And this is a whole palette that you can use to make decisions about what to grow together in the garden, from you know the very upright trees to the very low uh, light texture ground covers. Um, and of course, uh, color plays a very important uh, role in our selection and in our design. Um, and we think of color, OK, the flowers are great. But we, 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 we should also be very cognizant of the fact that foliage is what's around the most. And so um, looking at foliage, um, even the greens have a whole variety of, of uh, colors from the grays of the artichoke to the sort of lime greens to the dark greens to the reddish colors. And the whole notion of composition and taking these textures and colors and putting them together so that they play off of each other, so the, the complementary colors like the red and the yellows, or the cool colors like the blues and the greens together, um, and the combination of form, texture, and, and, and color to, to create these wonderful composition, compositions. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about design elements. Um, and in this case, uh, we'll start with the boundaries and edges. Um, and again, we saw those in the, in the, in the community garden that we, um, that we heard about at the beginning of the talk here. Um, and they can take form of a planted boxwood edge um, or found materials uh, or these woven wattle um, edges. But they create uh, an, a definition of space and also make it possible to tend tend the garden. Um, and in these beautiful edible gardens, we want to give a sense of tidiness um, and, organi and, and feel like we, it's a recognizable form um, or, 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 or space. They also protect our, our uh, crops within. So jumping to paths. Um, and a whole myriad of, of, and I couldn't put enough slides in here to show the uh, opportunities for our path materials, from very simple stone edged or brick edged with mulch, um, or even paved paths with little growies going in between them. They also provide comfortable access, they provide structure, and they can even give a sense of style to the garden. Um, of course, we're talking about larger, larger gardens. Oh, we've done the support structures. Oh, no, we didn't do the support structures. Um, these beautiful woven support structures for um, 
growing our vines um, that also play a very strong role in our edible landscapes, as you saw the kiwi before. Um, they're very adaptable to lots of opportunities. Um, and here are some beautifully uh, woven from natural materials. Um, and including here at the top right, the beginnings of the espalier uh, fruit tree uh, that shows some um, you know, beginning of a structure, support structure. Um, and then below the obelisk and the, the little screen, the little, uh, that, you know, can be used to, to as focal points um, in, in the designs. Um, below, just choosing focal points, which can be a structure like the little greenhouse here at the end of the path, or they can be a pot with, um, you know, a very variegated plant that stands out, or even just a simple um, ornamental plant uh, with with a flowering, um, uh, you know, significant flowering. Um, other features with a little more care and maintenance, which is this apple arch and the, the green bean tunnel, which is also always a fun example um, to create a little bean, uh, bean tunnel or bean teepee. Um, espalier, um, espalier in pairs on the south wall, very successful way of um, incorporating edibles. Um, and then just showing this hedge here, and um, yes, we have a full-time gardener working on this thing, but the tidy green hedge creates structure and form for the garden. And then you plant your crops on the inside, which you can use annuals or the perennials to create that, those spaces. So just jumping ahead to um, thinking about layout. And we understand that that plants are temporal. They, have, um, they, they change over time. Um, so thinking creatively of how to use uh, ornamentals with edibles to create a sense of space um, using uh, repetition, rhythm, variety, um, and, and creating a geometry, in this case, a formal geometry. And here's an example um, from um, uh, a, a book that I, I think I've resourced in the, in the, at the end of the, of the, chat, of the uh, talk for you all to have uh, access to. Um, informal layout, here it is, The Creative Vegetable Gardening by Joy Larkin. Um, so here, not so formal, uh, the idea of creating uh, gathering spaces within the, the, the garden um, so that you're not only out there working all the time, but you're also out there getting to enjoy it um, is a critical part, I think, of, of um, including edibles in people landscapes. Um, just in wrapping up, uh, so hopefully we have some time for, for questions. Um, this idea of permaculture, um, which is the sustainable human environment, it's a land use ethic, which is ecologically sound, um, economically viable, and it doesn't exploit or pollute. So um, the diagram uh, on the right-hand side, you'll see the zones, which the more intensive zones are closer to the house, and then just the logical um, progression of the less intensive in the next uh, sort of zone, and then finally the furthest ones uh, uh, that are, are the least intensive away from the house. So a variety of ideas of how to organize the garden. Um, pictured here is Will Hooker, our famous permaculture um, um, beloved professor, um, with his um, uh, spiral uh, garden, uh, which is another example of how to do things efficiently so that you can get to it, and beautifully, so full of whimsical uh, examples of, of plant materials. Um, the mandala garden and the keyhole garden, also um, you know, language that we see used in the, in this, in the um, permaculture uh, practices. Um, so all these gardens create a sense of space, even the little tiny pot outside the urban window. Um, the, the idea of that this is a sensory uh, sen uh, centered uh, art and that we consider ourselves sort of artists that provide this uh, for uh, people and, um, and you know, the idea that, that we, we take the taking the edibles and the ornamentals to create these spaces. Um, just next slide here is the um, references to where uh, images came from and some of these resources. Um, and I just would like to end that uh, with um, 
back to Renoir from the garden to the table. Um, and that's the big thing. Um, I loved hearing how the children celebrated and learned how to cook their, 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 their beautiful uh, produce at the Junaleska School. And um, I hope this has inspired you to uh, help promote beautiful ed edible landscapes. Um, that fit individuals' needs, their particular needs, um, and also uh, fit the uniqueness of each site that you address. Um, and with that, I hope we have some time for, for questions. Thank you, Julie. We do have time for questions. Let's see. I know we have a lot of, of people who don't have access to a mic, so we might need to give a minute for people to type into the chat box. But any of those of you who have a mic and have a question for Julie, please go ahead and ask away. And I may need some coaching on how to uh, how to do that to get those questions. I see some raised hands here. That's applause. OK, so Sarah says, can we replay this presentation for our local volunteers? Oh, OK. <laughs> Great. Uh, yes, please. Um, I, I'm happy to share a, a anything. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to uh, uh, share with you. And we could spend a whole semester talking about details. But I, I threw a lot of things out there. So hopefully, we'll inspire folks to, to dig deeper and, and get some um, so, so Julie has given me a copy of her PowerPoint, and I will put that up on our Plants, Pests, and Pathogens um, protected area for agents to download to use. In their Julie, any suggestions for good-looking fences, especially for deer? Oh, boy. Um, the deer issue, yeah. I've seen you know, top dollar where you have the very tall chain link um, with, uh, and they, 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 they had to add the uh, CDs hanging from them to even deter, try to deter them even more. Um, uh, I, I, it depends on the aesthetic of the garden um, and, and the, the area that you're trying to enclose. Um, but I've seen some beautiful uh, cedar posts with uh, chicken wire um, and then some you know, bright, uh, bright uh, you know, ribbons tied to them. Um, but I'll, I'll, have to, I'll have to do a little more research on that. But yeah, that's a, that's a real challenge, absolutely. I think you should try to combine it with the aesthetic of the garden. Uh, plants for the no plant lists for the novice. Um, I think some of the ones that I gave would be really good because it includes, you know, and I broke them up into uh, annuals, perennials, herbs, and 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 then some, you know, larger plants. Um, I, I love herbs because they're very forgiving. <laughs> Just don't water them <laughs> too much. Um, so I think I think you've got some good lists here, and in, in the ones that I that I that I pointed out, the perennials, annuals, um, herbs, and then the the natives um, that you could have success with. Let's see. Oh boy, good question. Okay. Liz Driscoll could help with that. Yeah. Yeah, Liz probably would be a good one. Four to six hours of sun. Yeah, six hours is probably uh, the limit. Um, you, uh, the the. Lucy, you may have yeah, a Yeah, I'd be happy to help. I think if you're looking at, at trying to grow things in, in less sunlight, you're going to look at, at things where you're going to be harvesting the leaves or the roots or the shoots as opposed to trying to harvest the flowers or the fruits so it doesn't have to go through its whole life, life cycle. So things where you're doing chards and spinaches and lettuces and those types of plants are going to grow in the, in the shade. The Solomon seal will do well in the shade. And um, Julie also talked about the ostrich fern. The Solomon seal does well in dry shade. The, the ostrich fern does better in wet 
what shade? Great, and that answers that second question, the damp areas. Um, and I think uh, uh, basil is a good damp area uh, herb. Yes, uh, there's a whole system of uh, uh, the Three Sisters Garden uh, and other other combinations that work well, the corn, the um, beans, and the squash uh, together. Um, Lucy, I don't know if you can address that one as well, to plant combinations. The combinations? Um, yeah. That, and that's the, the one you, you think of most commonly. Yeah, the Three Sisters Garden is all is is a is a is a winner because the corn provides a structure for the beans to climb up, um, and then the ground cover protects and and keeps the moisture in the soil. Oh yes, but you saw you know some of the guilds with the uh, with the nitrogen fixing clover at the base of the fruit tree, um, and then. Uh, Prince Charles had the fruit tree with the beautiful lavender at the base of it. So, um, you know, I think it's open. I think you're also thinking of combinations in terms of harvest. So things that you're going to be able to harvest over time, as opposed to having everything yes. come all at the same time. Yes. Yes. Julie, there's a question earlier that says, does putting edibles with ornamentals help hide them from the insect pests? Oh, honestly, um, we, we should ask um, entomologists, but mm -hmm. I just heard a talk about uh, Mount Vernon's uh, kitchen garden, and it was a curious thing that they were they had gone back to restore it to its original state, and they did archaeological digs to figure this out, and they figured out they were in, in big square beds, and the first 10 feet of the bed was all ornamentals. Um, and then all the edible plants were on the inside of that. Um, so one of the comments during that lecture was that uh, presumably that the the bugs would go to the to the uh, ornamentals and and then eventually hopefully not get to the edibles on the inside of the bed. Mm. Lynn Nelson po points out that Debbie Roos's website, Growing Small Farms, has the answers to a lot of these questions. Oh, good. Yeah, I'm I'm a designer primarily, so I I, I can learn from you all pr more than more about the plant uh, details. Oh, there we go. Yes, In increased flower helps attract insect predators and beneficial. So uh, from Durham County, thank you. Okay, any other questions for Julie? What's edible in your own landscape? Oh, in my own landscape, well, I have a fig tree, and then um, you know, like the cobbler's shoes, uh, the children's, the cobbler's children. My garden is uh, very low maintenance. I do put in a few tomatoes, peppers, um, lots and lots of herbs. I love herbs, um, so I completely neglect them. I don't water them. I do give them really nice soil. Um, so I'm still, I'm still picking tomatoes off the vine. Um, but uh, yes, I do have a little patch of, of annual uh, edibles and then my wonderful fig tree. <laughs> Julie, thank you for joining us today and for sharing your, your knowledge and the inspiration from your, your PowerPoint and then your willingness to share your, your PowerPoint as well. But the hands that you see flashing up there are, are clapping for you, the, the silent applause of, of <laughs> I thought they were illuminate. <laughs> Okay, good. Okay. Thank you all. Sure. Next up we have Dave Steffen from the Department of Entomology to talk about current issues in, in insects. Uh, good morning. I just switched on my mic. Um, I hope people can hear me. Loud and clear. Loud and clear. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to talk uh, first about a few samples that we've got come in recently to the clinic. Uh, and then I'm going to talk some about how insects deal with winter, since winter is uh, knocking on our doorstep now. And this is a subject that is particularly near and dear to my heart, the uh, winter active insects and different kinds that they are, where they occur, how they make a living, and uh, what kinds we have here in North Carolina. So first I'm going to mention the lantana lace bug, which uh, Tom Campbell coincidentally talked about a little while ago. This is a species that uh, naturally occurs from the, the deep south of the United States through Central and South America. 
and in recent years uh, seems to have been spreading along the coast as far to, to North Carolina. It was not reported from North Carolina during a survey for lace bugs back in the 1970s, but as uh, prolific as it is and as prominent as it is on Lantana, uh, it seems hard that it would have been missed, especially since we already have another species of lace bug that's re been reported on Lantana here in North Carolina. But uh, although it's been reported from other kinds of plants in, uh, uh, in farther south and in the tropics, uh, here in North Carolina, it probably feeds exclusively on Lantana. And as Tom also mentioned, uh, Lantana camara is uh, oh, it's a beautiful ornamental plant. In warmer climates, it uh, sometimes escapes cultivation and it becomes a rather uh, persistent invasive weed. And the Lantana lacebug has been introduced to a number of countries uh, in Africa, Australia, parts of Asia, to help control Lantana. Oh, sorry. Um, let me go back a moment. OK. Uh, the nymphs of the uh, Lantana lace bug, unfortunately, is not, that, that's not showing. Where is your button up there? Okay. I'm sorry, we're holding a, a technical problem here. Is that the one? Is that it? All right. OK, there we go. Um, well, I'm screwed up here again as usual. But uh, the nymphs of the Lantana lace bug, like the nymphs of other species of lace bug, have spines on them. I'm afraid it's not the, the greatest shot in the world. But the damage produced by the Lantana lace bug is similar to that of other species of lace bugs on their host plants, where from above you see large chlorotic splotches and spots all over the leaf. And then you flip the leaf over and you see the dark fecal spots like here, and you'll find uh, shed skins. And uh, the, uh, I'm not sure how they overwinter. I assume that they overwinter as eggs like most other species of lace bugs do, the eggs laying, being laid in the foliage of the plant or possibly on the surface of the leaves. Uh, in any case, it's a species that has spread uh, northward at least as far as Tyrrell County. And I guess uh, Tom is seen in Pascatan County, so it's farther than that. It's probably in Virginia by now. The other species in the genus, Teleonemia, uh, say one other, Teleonemia nigrida, has been reported on Lantana. Uh, second species has been reported on beautyberry, uh, genus Calicarpa, which occurs naturally here in North Carolina, even looks like an exotic plant of some kind. I have not personally seen that one. And a third species uh, has only been collected a couple of times as adults, uh, but we don't know for sure what the host plant of that one is. OK, uh, bed bugs have obviously been in the news a great deal in recent years because of their resurgence and the problems they cause when they get into homes. They're very difficult to control and they get very expensive trying to control them. But there are actually hundreds of different species of bat bugs and bird bugs, the family simicity to which the bed bug belongs. And the vast majority of those do not feed on humans, even when they come into contact with them. They stay on their respective bird or bat hosts. And one species that we do sometimes get in that is very closely related and very similar to the bed bug is the bat bug, Symex adjunctus. And this species occurs naturally here in the United States, uh, generally uh, east of the Rocky Mountains, uh, from Florida probably to Canada, and has been reported uh, from several species of bats, including species like big brown bat, little brown bat, and other species that are the ones most likely to roost in our attics if they gain access to our attics. We have no evidence for certain that this species will feed on people, although it's possible it could do so. Some of the samples we've had come in, people have reported finding them in the home, uh, sometimes in a particular part of the home close to where they're gaining access from uh, an attic or a wall void where the bats might be roosting. But they don't report these things biting them at all. So there's a good possibility they simply don't. The species will not bite people. As I indicated, it's, very, it's in the same genus as the bed bug and very similar to it. And I apologize for these images, but these are ones that were sent to us and they didn't turn out very well. A couple of features that distinguish this bat bug from the bed bug is that the CD or hairs along the margin of the pronotum are much longer than in the bed bug. And these were a lot more visible in the uh, images when we received them than they are in this image here. And also, we're having a, uh, this is not reaching. OK. The, uh, the hind, the femur of the hind leg, this is the large section here, 
And this species is less than three times as long as it is wide at the widest point, whereas in the bed bug, the hind femur is more than three times as long as it is wide. Once you've seen a few of these things, uh, you get to recognize the features pretty quickly, and they're easy to separate uh, under a microscope uh, or even eyeballing them. At least two other species of bird bugs have turned up in homes occasionally here in North Carolina, one of which is associated with chimney swifts and sometimes gets found around fireplaces uh, or on the hearth or, or above the uh, fireplace. And another species we started to see a couple of times in recent years that we're not sure what it's a feeding on, but it's maybe associated with swallows that can be nesting in or around the house. Uh, critters, uh, these are native insects. These are large beetles of the genus Prionus, which is part of the longhorn beetle family. And there are three species of these Prionus here in North Carolina, which I'll, I'll get onto that a little more in a moment. The uh, Prionine serendicids include the largest species we have here in North Carolina, the largest species of longhorn beetles. And there's one species in South America which is uh, probably the longest species of beetle in the world. The adults are, can be more than six inches long, but it may not be the heaviest species in the world. The Goliath beetle of Africa, which is one of the scarab beetles, is, is bulkier and, and may weigh more than this prionine beetle from uh, South America. Most of the larvae of prionines here in the United States are associated with dead wood rather than living wood. And in situations where structural wood has uh, had some moisture damage. Certain species may get in there occasionally and further increase the damage. Uh, of the three species of prionis, <coughs> excuse me, known to occur in North Carolina, two of them feed uh, within the roots or on the roots of living plants. Those species are the broadneck root borer, uh, prionis laticalis, and the tile horn prionis, prionis imbricornis. The third species, Prionus pocularis, is found in the cane uh, stumps of, of pine and occasionally in the logs. The two species that bore within the roots of uh, trees can uh, move through the soil from tree to tree and either bore within the root or perhaps feed on the uh, smaller roots. We had a sample come in time one time of hosta where apparently a larva had been grazing on the roots underneath the clump of hosta and just sheared them all off like a pine bull might. As you can see, these are not actually not quite mature larvae here that this fall is holding. Uh, fully mature larvae can be up to almost three inches long. The adult, the prionis, uh, males are smaller than females. Males might be an inch and a quarter to an inch and a half. Uh, females might be up to two and a quarter inches long. They can be pest in orchards, uh, tree plantations, nurseries, uh, sometimes even in yards, but usually in natural areas uh, where you have a variety of tree species, different ages, uh, natural enemies, enemies of these things, uh, you're not going to have a big problem from them. And these specimens came in uh, as digital images a few weeks ago, and they were boring in the roots or in the base of blueberries from a field in Sampson County. The field was probably five or six years old and had previously been a longleaf pine flatwoods, so there would have been ample opportunity for a natural population of these longhorn beetles to be in the area. And even though the images were, were pretty good, I was unable to be certain which species we were dealing with because I just couldn't see the fine features necessary to separate them. But you can see here how they were boring within the root, and this is the kind of damage they can cause underground, invisible, uh, and unseen, but often pretty extensive. OK, now I want to move on to how insects and other arthropods deal with winter, especially those that overwinter. <coughs> Excuse me, overwinter. Um, most species of arthropods spend the winter in a, a hibernating or diapausing state. And, and diapause is a term we use when insects are in a resting state. It could be under, you know, in, our, in the summertime, it could be in, in the winter. It's, it's when they're dormant, waiting for an environmental cue to trigger them to break the diapause and begin developing. Since insects are, are cold blooded, of course, they can't keep themselves warm. So it's uh, difficult uh, for most species to be active during the winter. Their, their physiologies don't just don't allow them to be active when the temperatures are cold like that. Uh, even if they could be active, since most uh, plants, uh, trees are bare and their herbaceous vegetation is gone, the food of the insects would be unavailable to them. But the stage in which different species of insects and arthropods overwinter 
varies according to the species. You can have insects overwintering as eggs, newly hatched uh, juveniles or larvae, partially grown juveniles, nymphs, larvae, uh, prepupal larvae within a cocoon, the pupae, or as adults. To survive the freezing temperatures they encounter in northern climates, insects may produce a natural antifreeze in their bodies, or they may reduce the water content of their bodies to a much lower level, uh, or in many cases actually survive being frozen. Uh, I'm going to go through some examples of the different kind of insects here in North Carolina in different stages as they go through the winter. Now, you may recall that last uh, couple of months ago, I talked about the Carolina mantid. We had that one that kept attacking Mike Munster on the camera there and, and how he withstood the assault. The, uh, those insects which overwinter as eggs usually do so in some kind of cell, um, either a cocoon or, in this case, an uotheca. And the uh, uotheci of uh, mantids often resemble small loaves of bread or some other kind of pastry like this. And for those species which are native to North Carolina, the size and shape of the oothica is uh, distinctive enough that we can tell the different species apart just based on that. During oviposition, the uh, oothica has a, a frothy texture which will harden into a very tough material. Try, even trying to cut it with a razor blade is surprisingly difficult. And as she's de depositing this material at intervals, the female will uh, deposit a layer of eggs within the oothica. And if you look at the, for some reason this pointer doesn't want to go where I'm trying to get it to go, but, excuse me a second, all right, um, you can see there's a segmented appearance here across the top and the eggs are deposited in layers within those, you know, like think of uh, loaves of bread with, uh, or excuse me, the individual slices of bread within a loaf. This is a, just another shot of the same uothiki. Uh, when the female deposits them, she may deposit them on you know, natural vegetation like branches or vines or sometimes on houses or, or other man-made objects. And uh, female mantids mature for in, in the late summer. And if the weather is good and they're able to get a lot of food, they may, uh, female may produce several uothiki uh, before cold weather gets her. One time I raised a Chinese mantid and you kept her extremely well fed, and at regular 10 or 11 day intervals, almost like clockwork, she would produce another Uothiki until she had produced seven of them, and this was getting into December finally, and of course she was inside, and she finally just uh, passed away of either old age or perhaps exhaustion. Uh, but I unfortunately did not keep those Uothiki and put them outdoors to see whether they were, they were all equally fertile and whether young hatched from each one because she only made it one time before she started to lay her eggs. Uh, despite uh, the good protection, they are not completely invulnerable to uh, predation or parasitization. There are certain tiny wasps that may lay their eggs within the Uothiki and I honestly don't know if they manage to get to the eggs while the female is producing the otheca or if they find it later and simply drill in with their tiny ovipositor. Uh, in any case, uh, sometimes we do get the parasitoid wasps emerging instead of the baby mantids. And if a bird like a chickadee or a titmouse happens to find uh, an otheca when the young are hatching, it may just sit there and, and feed on the young and, and sort of ravage that, that particular clutch. Another species that overwinters in the egg stage is the wheel bug. And this is one of our largest species of assassin bugs here in North Carolina. Typically, the female will lay her eggs on bark of a tree, on the trunk, or on one of the larger limbs, but sometimes uh, on the side of a building, as is the case here. And this is a really nice shot because it shows the young nymphs just as they're hatching. The, the pale yellow ones are very newly emerged, probably just minutes old. And then you see the dark individuals are a little bit older here. They're starting to darken up a bit. And then finally, you've got the ones that probably hatched some hours ago have uh, fully darkened up now. But they will stay together for a while and eventually uh, disperse. But when the female lays her eggs, she coats it with a thin material, somewhat like varnish, which protects them from water, which if it seeped in between the eggs would then freeze as ice crystals and can damage the eggs. Uh, underneath the varnish layer, the eggs are protected from that, and they will spend several months through the winter in diapause until warmer weather in the spring stimulates them to break the diapause and begin the development. 
then typically uh, in April sometime here in central North Carolina, uh, they will hatch. Other species of true bugs, like stink bugs and leaf-footed bugs, for example, may overwinter as nymphs or adults. Now, when I was a kid growing up in New York State, uh, one of the things we would do looking for insects in the winter was to go out and hunt cocoons. And this is the, the kind of cocoon people, especially in the north, often think about. This is the polyphemus moth, one of our large uh, silk moth species. And this one was submitted as a sample extending in the actual cocoon. And you can see that uh, this one was spun around uh, with a leaf surrounding. You can see the vein, well, the midrib of the leaf here, and you can see the lateral veins of the leaf. And in the early stages of spinning the cocoon, the caterpillar attached the silk uh, along the petiole of the leaf to attach it to the stem so that it wouldn't fall to the ground, and then finished by wrapping itself up within the cocoon, uh, spinning as it went. And uh, the cocoon, I mean, they will hang on the tree through the winter, and there is absolutely no protection in a cocoon like that from the temperatures. But as long as it protects them from the water, which might seep in and freeze on the surface, that's the thing that insects really have to be aware of. That's what they, well, they don't fear it, but that's the thing that will kill them in the winter, is not the cold temperatures, but if water gets to them and encases them. And uh, one thing I noticed when I first uh, came to North Carolina many years ago is that you didn't see very many cocoons hanging on trees like I did as a kid up north. And I used to wonder about that. And I had a couple of theories, one being that uh, even though they were exposed to colder temperatures hanging up there on the trees, in the north you had a more predator. They would spend much more time in the leaf litter on the ground if they crawled down to the ground. You would have mice and shrews and, and other small animals that could get to the cocoons as they were in the leaf litter on the ground, whereas up on the tree there would only be a few hardy birds that might spend the winter there and, uh, and could prey on them. Uh, here in the south, where you have a lot more bird species during the winter, it might be uh, a little more too advantageous to risk going to the ground to spin your cocoon rather than staying up in the tree where many more species of birds were around and, and might get to them. But that's just a theory. I really don't know why. Now, this is another sample. This is actually a cecropia moth. Uh, but it's a close relative of the polyphemus moth, and this one was sent in as an image. And if you were to open the cocoon of the polyphemus moth, the, uh, the pupil would look something like this. And you can actually see the outline of various adult features on the surface of the pupa. You've got the, the eye here, uh, you've got the antennae, you've got the, the legs between the antennae, and then, of course, the wings are visible. Uh, since this is a pupa that normally would be in the cocoon, it probably would, be, it would not survive trying to rear it this way. Uh, most people have seen bagworms, and this is a species that we're very familiar with. The uh, species prefers trees in the Cupressaceae uh, family, things like arborvitae, juniper, cedar, Leyland cypress, and so on. It may feed on others as well. But the caterpillars mature in late summer, and then they close up their cocoons. And after a few weeks, the females lay their eggs within the cocoon. And this is a species that overwinters its eggs enclosed within the female's bag slash cocoon. And they emerge the following spring and begin to feed. Just another shot of a bagworm. Uh, this one is a nearly mature larva that is still feeding. When it's fully grown, it will secure that bag to the branch or to a stem uh, with very strong silk. The silk that is so strong it will actually constrict the branch and keep it from growing. And then it will seal it up and uh, pupate inside. After a few weeks, the males emerge from their cocoons and seek out the cocoons of the females who remain within and uh, made through an opening in the bottom of the cocoon, and, and she lays her eggs and dies. Of the several species of bagworms present in North Carolina, this is probably our most familiar since it's the one most likely to become a pest on ornamental trees and shrubs. But we do have others, uh, some of which are smaller and feed only on, for example, lichens growing on tree trunks, so they don't really cause any damage to uh, plants of our concern. Some species of moths don't spin any kind of cocoon at all, but simply burrow into the soil and uh, just kind of wiggle around until they hollow out a pupal cell, and then they shed the skin and become the pupa within the ground. Many of the hornworms do this. Uh, some caterpillars, like oakworms and the green striped maple worm, certain species of cutworms, uh, and others will do this. Um, they don't 
they probably have silk glands. Uh, in fact, I, I know they do, but they don't use silk to prepare a cocoon. And if uh, this is a species with multiple generations, the, the pupa may develop directly to an adult and emerge in a few weeks, or if this is in the fall of the year, it will go ahead and diapause and not emerge until the following spring. This one, uh, by the way, was feeding on a uh, butterfly bush. A friend of mine found the caterpillar in his yard and sent me the image, and I wasn't sure what it was, but he collected it and reared it um, and then sent me the pupa, and I'm anxiously waiting to see which species emerges next spring, because we haven't had any records of any of these uh, sinks moths on butterfly bush before. Um, just uh, kind of an aside for a moment here, you know, most moths have the, the tongue case, which is visible here, fused to the surface of the pupa, and you can only make it out in, in kind of a boss relief. Uh, but many spingens that have exceptionally long tongues have the tongue case free so that it can accommodate the longer tongue. And <clears throat> the, the tongue actually extends from the, the head out to the case and then loops back on itself within the case. There are some species of uh, sphinx moths that have tongues longer than their own bodies, and in that case, the, the tongue case may actually be looped or coiled on the outside of the pupa, a very bizarre looking uh, sort of feature. Uh, many of you know that uh, the pupal state of butterflies is called a chrysalis. And again, butterflies uh, don't usually use uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, silk to spin any kind of cocoon, but they use uh, silk to prepare for, for pupation, and it's not really easy to see here, but uh, before it pupated, the caterpillar produced a little pad of silk on the stem of this eupatorium, and then it grasped the uh, that pad with its hind legs as a larva, and then hung down waiting uh, as a pre-pupa until it shed its skin a few days later. Then the uh, a structure called a cremaster, a cluster of uh, little hooks at the tip of the abdomen, uh, it comes out of the, the larval skin and jabs itself into that pad of silk, uh, wedges itself in there, and catches on those hooks, and then the, the chrysalis will hang securely from the plant uh, until the butterfly emerges. Uh, some chrysalis, butterfly chrysalises, are say gr colored green to blend in with foliage of vegetation. Others have bizarre angles or processes on them to help camouflage them as some kind of plant structure. Now, this is the adult of the snout butterfly. And as <clears throat> I mentioned earlier, um, species which uh, may have two or more generations a year, the chrysalis will develop directly to the adult stage if the, chrysalis, if the larva was growing from spring into early summer. But if it's growing later in the summer, in the fall, it will go ahead and diapause uh, till the following year, so as it does not emerge prematurely in the fall of the year, and, and there's, there's nothing for the larvae to feed on. This is another butterfly chrysalis. This is a species of swallowtail butterfly, probably either a black swallowtail or a tiger swallowtail that Mike Munster found on a piece of firewood at his house. Uh, there are certain butterflies, in addition to the, the cremaster and the silk pad at the tip of the abdomen, also spin a band or girdle of silk around themselves uh, while they're in the pre-pupal condition. This band is spun in a single motion, and the caterpillar really needs to get it right on first try, because I don't think they get a second chance at doing something like that. But when the pupa, when the larva finally starts to shed its skin into the pupal state, the skin will slip from underneath that band of silk as it's uh, sliding down the body, and then the skin will be discarded at the tail end of the body. And as you can imagine, this looks very much like a broken stub of wood or a broken twig, something like that, probably part of the camouflage to help protect them from visual predators like birds or butterfly collectors. Uh, one experiment I, I read about uh, some years ago I'd just like to mention, and I, I don't, unfortunately don't have the, the actual reference here, but a chrysalis of some species of a swallowtail butterfly, presumably one of the northern species, in its uh, in fall mode, so it was going to diapause through the winter, they took it and very gradually lowered the temperature of that chrysalis to approximately the temperature of liquid nitrogen, which is about minus 320 degrees Fahrenheit lowering temperature slowly enough so that the pupa could gradually adjust its internal physiology to accommodate the dropping temperature. 
And then after a little time at that temperature, they again very slowly raise the temperature back to, to normal. And at some point, the, a normal looking adult butterfly emerged. That, that seemed pretty remarkable to me, although nowadays with you know, cryogenics, uh, it seems like almost anything is possible with freezing. Okay, um, as I mentioned earlier, many insects also overwinter in the adult stage. And if you're in an area where you've got brown marmorated stink bugs or uh, certain species of leaf-footed bugs or maybe those uh, Asian uh, lady beetles, uh, you're going to be having problems with these sometimes. Uh, many true bugs, like, like stink bugs, will hibernate as solitary individuals. Others, they're gregarious, and you'll get uh, many individuals coming together. The natural hibernacula include, say, crevices in rock outcrops or under loose bark on trees or in tree cavities. And as I mentioned earlier, shelter from the cold is not critical. They can't really shelter themselves from the cold when it surrounds them for months on end. But sheltering from free water that might encase them as ice, that is the critical point. When these insects try to enter our homes, they can be a nuisance, uh, but they're not actually going to cause any damage unless you happen to crush or squash one of them on a painted or fabric surface where you might leave a stain. Um, I think we have had some mention of brown marmorated stink bug before. The species is in North Carolina. It's probably quite widespread now, but uh, is going to be increasing in numbers in, in the next few years. Uh, one last mention of uh, insects as they overwinter. These are some scale insects that I collected a few weeks ago when I was visiting family and friends up north, the pine needle scale. And scale insects really have no choice when it comes to the winter. They, uh, they have to, they, they're immobile, they stay there, and uh, there is no shelter at all from the freezing temperatures. They just you know, have to tough it out. Uh, these were individuals were on Nugo Pine in upstate New York, uh, a place where temperatures can easily reach minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit in the winter. And I know because I had to walk six miles uphill to school and six miles uphill home in the winter at times when the temperature was that cold. All right, just a few more things here before I wrap up because it's Mike's turn. But there are actually uh, many species of arthropods which are deliberately active on the surface uh, of the ground or on vegetation during the winter. Uh, adaptations in their physiology allow them to be active at temperatures that normally would, would slow down or kill most other arthropods. And you kind of wonder, well, why would they want to be doing this in the winter? Uh, there are several possible advantages. Uh, just some, some of them here are. Uh, number one, the reduction in competition from other arthropods. In other words, there's nothing else out there competing with you, so you've got the, the playing field to yourself. Reduction in predation, since most of the predators on you, spiders, predatory insects, birds, uh, are either hibernating or have migrated south. You have uh, three, you have access to recently fallen leaves, which are an exceedingly uh, a nutrient poor but seemingly inexhaustible food resource. Uh, especially when you start getting the fungi and bacteria in growing on the leaves, which could provide a, an additional food source. Uh, four is a specialization for feeding or, uh, or preying on other cold weather organisms. Uh, five, emerging as an adult in the, in the late winter to lay your eggs so that your eggs, uh, your hatching larvae, get an, uh, a jump on the competition. And the sooner they hatch out in the early spring, the sooner they get the feeding. And in the first one of these plant pests and pathogens we did this year, I talked some about the eastern ten caterpillar and the who I think it lays on the stems and how the larvae will start to hatch out uh, as early as late February or early March around uh, the Raleigh area. So here in North Carolina, of uh, the 30 orders that we have, at least 18 include the uh, critters that are active during the cold months. And that's not counting the aquatic species, which you may have. Um, you know, active during the winter, or things like lice, which could be active on their bird and, and mammal hosts. And one time, final final word here, one time on a trip home to uh, to New York, Christmas one year, I went out on, on one day, it was temperature near 40 degrees after a light snow the previous night, and just crawling around, flying around, creeping around on the snow, on rocks, on tree trunks, I was able to find representatives of some nine orders and 16 families of insects and approximately 25 species they were active on that day. So even in the Great White North, you can get insects active like that. One last example of uh, insects that are active in the winter, there are several 
families of stoneflies, which include species which are active in the winter here. They emerge starting in uh, November or December here in North Carolina, and they'll continue through uh, February into March. They're along um, in rivers and streams. The adults uh, emerge, crawl up on tree trunks, on rocks, or just on the shore. If there's snow on the ground, they even be crawling around on the surface of the snow at temperatures at or below freezing. And then once they mate, the females return to water and lay their eggs. And the eggs may not hatch immediately, but in fact may diapause through the warmer months of the summer. And then as the water starts to cool the following fall, just about the time that all those falling leaves are entering the water and providing great food resource, that's when they emerge and complete the development in a few months. And with that, I will stop, ask if there are any questions, and uh, turn it over to Mike, who is sitting here patiently waiting for me. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Hey, can everyone hear me okay? Give me a thumbs up there or a check. All right, unfortunately, I missed the previous presentations. I had class from 10.15 until now and just walked in and caught the end of Dave's. I did know that Dave was going to be talking about insect, insects in the winter and prepared the last few slides of my presentation to talk about pathogens and what they do in the winter. But I wanted to start out with a few other topics, some of which were sort of new and unusual. But actually, before anything else, I wanted to go back and cover the questions that were posed in September that I wasn't able to answer. And there were two. We were talking, for those of you who missed it, about fruit rot in apples, blueberries, and peaches. And the questions came up as to whether or not there are any kind of organic control options for fruit rots in the home orchard. And another question that came up about bacterial spot on peach. And neither of these has easy answers. And I did have to go to the experts on it. And here's what we were able to put together. The question really centers on the whole spray issue. Many of the things I talked about, this is basically a repeat slide from last time, many of the things we talked about were practices that can be done in an organic production system, such as pruning and not leaving mummified fruit and branches on the ground and removing fruit as soon as you see it, not leaving berries on the bushes that are overripe and so on. So a lot of different cultural practices are quite compatible with organic production. The place the rubber meets the road is when we have to talk about fungicide sprays and what can be used. And there are not many options. Basically, and we're focusing here on the apples and peaches, the products that can be used are sulfur or lime sulfur. They need, however, to be applied at close intervals, basically 7 to 10 days, depending on the weather. Now, the sulfur can be used with a little bit of copper in it. But that has to be done very carefully. An extremely low dose of copper, what Turner Sutton was saying for apples, is one to one and a half grams of active ingredients per gallon of water. So that would be two to three grams of a product that has 50% AI. And that's to avoid copper phytotoxicity, in other words, burning of the plant tissue. And this is especially a problem on peaches after bloom. Another thing that you have to watch out for on the copper products is the post, or sorry, the pre-harvest interval. With sulfur, it's basically immediately at zero days. But with copper, then you've got some other time, uh, the frame, time frame that you have to be careful of. Also, and most of you know this, never apply sulfur within two weeks of any oil spray, if, unless you're talking about the dormant season, it doesn't matter. And also at high temperatures, because you can get sulfur burning the foliage. And finally, just to mention that not all formulations of these products are registered as organic. So if you're under a certified organic scheme, then make sure that what you're using is, in fact, allowed. A quick note that I found in the North Carolina Ag Chem Manual, which applies to a crop we didn't talk about, which is grapes, that a dormant application of lime sulfur can help reduce the overwintering inoculum 
or spores and the fungus itself of the um, of the fungi that cause black rot and phomopsis for the next year. When I asked Bill Klein, our blueberry specialist down at Castle Hain, this question, he was uh, all over it because he said, I reminded him of something that he was supposed to do, which was to put together a organic program for disease control in blueberries. And here are some of the things that he said, and this, this one I quoted because it was very interesting, that isolated plantings of blueberries where they started with disease-free plants have often done quite well with no fungicide sprays. So there's an advantage there, and again, emphasizing the importance of bringing in clean stock. Also, and I had mentioned this that last presentation, rabbit eye blueberry, for those areas where it's adapted, has far fewer disease problems than, than the other types. And again, don't leave overripe fruit on the bush. That will take care of most of your fruit rot problems, except for possibly mummy berry, which, remember, infects in the blossom stage. But he said, and I didn't know this, that they've gotten good results with Serenade, which is a bacillus product, for suppressing mummy berry and botrytis on blueberries. And then, of course, winter pruning to remove cankers and dead wood. The other question that had come up was about bacterial spot on peach, and that's, that is a tough one. First of all, we didn't talk about it last time. We were talking about the two main problems in home peach orchards, which are brown rot and peach scab. And the symptoms of bacterial spot on the peach fruit could be confused with scab. So first, be sure you know what you've got. But as far as control measures for this, one would be to find and start with a cultivar that has some genetic resistance. And if you do have cultivars that are very susceptible, you can use copper sprays. But again, this has to be done very carefully because they are so sensitive. We're talking in the fall, one or two applications, one in October when you've got leaf drop beginning, and one in November after leaf drop is nearly complete. And then in the late winter, three to five copper sprays before bloom to help you get ahead of the black, I'm sorry, the bacterial spot problem. And again, be very careful with the, the rates on peach because once the leaves start coming out, they are extremely sensitive. So any kind of copper application after bloom in peaches is very risky. All right, moving on then to some of the interesting things that have come in since we last talked. This was a picture that came in from Avery County. and. Um, Boylan. Is it Richard Boylan who's the agent up there? And I'm sorry, it was Ash County. And sent in these photos from some folks up there. They said that their sunflowers had started out fine, but then some of them were stunting, the stems were thickening, they got this model on the leaves. The flowers looked like they were well formed, but they didn't open completely. And what was the problem? Does anybody know what this is? If you do, go ahead and pick on your on your text box here and type it in. Oh, I guess people are stumped. Or sleep. All right, somebody said aster yellows. That is one of the things that I thought at first, too. That's not it. Virus? No, nope, turned out not to be a virus either. All right, what this happened to be, and I confirmed this with a physical sample here in the clinic. Get the slide to advance. We went too far. Except that all my clicks at one at one fell swoop there. All right. This turned out to be downy mildew. And it's interesting that we have reported this in North Carolina on Coryopsis, Rebecca, and even on ragweed before. But this is the first time 
that we've seen it on its headliner host of sunflower. And it's a pretty widely distributed problem, and I'm not sure why we haven't seen it before, except that we don't grow that many sunflowers. And you can see that the tissue that had been the uh, they had been yellow here, had turned necrotic, and then over here on the underside of the leaves, we can see the white sporulation of the pathogen. And this has got an interesting life cycle in that the spores produced here can go and infect other leaves, but it's also one of the downy mildews that's systemic. So it's systemic in the plants, and it can even survive in the roots. And the seedlings, it's like the scenario that they described. The seedlings come up, but then when they're young, they become infected through the roots, and the fungus moves up through the plant as it grows. Unfortunately, there is not much that can be done about this. It's able to survive in the soil 10 years or more, so rotation is not all that effective. There are some seed treatments, but I don't think there are any that are available to the homeowner that would protect the seedlings. And uh, I don't know of any ornamental type sunflowers that have genetic resistance to this disease, although in this particular case, the growers did mention that they had it more on some than on others. And I don't know if that was just by chance or because there was actually any kind of resistance in, in some of the sunflower varieties. This particular situation is one that we've talked about before, but I wanted to talk about it in a little more depth this time. Some pictures that Christy Breedenkamp sent up from the Department of Transportation site in Jackson County. And these specs here on the siding and the windows and the vehicles. Everybody know what this is? Yeah, artillery fungus. And the specs themselves? Eco pellets, egg masses, spore balls. I kind of gave it away here. Yeah, these are the spore balls of the artillery fungus, spherobolus. I learned in uh, looking up things about this when the pictures came in that there are now at least three different species described. We used to automatically say what species it was, but I backed off and just call it spherobolus sp now. Unfortunately, these specks are not going to come off unless you paint or scrape. The balls are, I should have mentioned this first, they are shot toward bright surfaces or toward the light, especially in the spring and the fall. And they're coming from the mulch. The fungus is down there in the bark mulch usually. And there's nothing you can do to control it there. There are no fungicides that are registered. The only thing I can say is that mulch is based on bark nuggets and cypress mulches were found by folks at the uh, Penn State University to be less favorable for the development of the fungus than some of the mixed wood chip bark type mulches. They also found that uh, spent mushroom spawn was less favorable than some of these bark mulches, but we don't have a uh, ready supply of that around here. So the recommendation would be to go more with the, the bark type mulch rather than, or cypress mulch rather than the wood chip mulches. But eventually, these could be colonized as well. So it's a matter of time and luck. Another interesting sample we got in in October was this one. And the question is, is this fungus decaying the fiberglass? And we set ourselves up with a true-false uh, thank you. So green check if you think that this is decaying the fiberglass, and uh, red X if you think that it is not. All right, and. The 11 who voted, voted correctly. Yes, the fungus is not decaying the fiberglass. That is false. What it was decaying was the wood in this particular shed. The paneling seemed to be pretty firm, so I'm not sure it was there. But in the door frame or windowsill, 
the fungus had done a good job of breaking this down. It wasn't quite as soft and friable as florist foam, but it was getting there. And it caused a brown cubicle rot. We identified the fungus as Wolfaporia extensa, which you may know by the name of Wolfaporia cocos. And it was a pretty dramatic situation talking to the homeowner there about how this thing was was warping the door frame on this particular shed that was set up on a concrete slab behind his carport. And we're still scratching our heads as to how this exactly got started. It turns out, according to Dr. Larry Grant, who studied with decay fungi for many years, he has never seen this particular fungus cause decay in a building before. Usually it's something you would find out in the um, like a pine stump or a dead tree, or I'm not sure if live trees or not, but uh, out in the out in the woods, it's a fairly famous fungus, as it turns out. In fact, it's the first fungus I've ever heard of with its own Facebook page. I don't know if its parents know about that. Um, the reason it's famous even before Facebook, though, was because of this large underground sclerotium that it forms. You may have heard it under the terms of tuckahoe or Indian bread because it was used as a survival food by native tribes. This one you probably wouldn't want to use even if you're very hungry. It's been in our teaching lab for many years. I only learned when I was getting this presentation ready, though, that it's also been used in traditional Chinese medicine, and it's known by the name of Fu Ling. This is, again, not from that particular sample. This is a, a specimen we have in the lab. Although this particular fungus was not one that we have ever seen before in building decay, it does allow me to talk about the issue in general here just very quickly of mold and wood decay. Both of these kinds of problems are almost always the result of a moisture problem. It could be a water leak, either rain getting in or from a broken pipe. Or it could be from condensation. And I mention this this time of year because we're getting ready to close up our houses tight and we have less air exchange, more condensation occurring on windows and possibly on poorly insulated walls and so forth that can lead to these problems with mold. The molds themselves, though, aren't what are going to cause wood decay. They are a bad sign that the conditions are moist and this could lead to wood decay eventually. So you want to take that as a red flag and something that needs to be addressed. Can the molds be a health hazard in and of themselves? Sometimes they can, particularly in people with compromised immune systems. And that's a complicated issue. Dr. Chuck Hodges does a lot of mold identification here in the clinic for us. And um, you have to kind of choose your words carefully when you talk about these things because some of the molds could cause problems and others are not known to, and it depends again on the immune status of the person and so forth. And let's switch back outside for a minute. A few people still haven't put in their pansies yet. And for those who haven't, what kind of symptoms do you want to be on the lookout for when you're buying your pansies so that you do not get black root rot. Go ahead and use your four letters there at the bottom of the participant list and make your selection. All right. You're not wrong to say A or B, but you're more right to say D. It's all of the above. Stunting, yellowing, and if I can move this. And the black roots themselves, as the name suggests, are all symptoms to watch out for. Fortunately, this year, here in the clinic, we haven't seen black root rot yet on pansies. And this is a good sign that maybe the producers are on top of things this year, and hopefully we won't have a lot of it going into the landscape. I think it was last year, though, that I did um, bring some pansies home from a roadside stand, and they looked a little odd to me. I had the advantage of having access to a microscope, brought them in, and found out that they were infected with black root rot and threw them away. Had I not done that, I would have introduced it into our soil. 
Here's a picture showing in the cell pack there some stunted and unhappy pansy plants, something you would not want to purchase. All right, another question. We clear the board here. What do you think is the host on which we most often see the Labiopsis being the cause of black root rot? You use your same letters there to vote. And while you're voting, notice the difference in the, in the root systems here. The healthy root system on the left and the diseased root system on the right. I think give you another second here to place your choices. All right. Okay, people are pretty on top of things here. In fact, the majority has it once again. We most often see black root rot on Japanese holly. In fact, we've seen it every month of the year. I don't mean this year, but over the course of the last several years, there's not been a month of the year that hasn't seen a diagnosis of black root rot on Japanese holly. And the number two is the uh, pansies or violas, if you take that as a group. It's interesting that the number three most often diagnosed uh, plant with black root rot is tobacco, but we don't usually worry about that with the uh, Master Gardener program. All of these on the list, Calibrachoa, Heuchera, Madagascar, Periwinkle, and others uh, are hosts, and it seems like every year we're discovering more hosts of this particular fungus. What can you do about it? Um, thinking especially about the pansies now, one would be the use of resistant cultivars, and there are some out there that have been identified. I don't have a current list, I mean a list of currently available cultivars that would have resistance though, so unfortunately I can't be that much help on that stem. The uh, information that I have would go back to the uh, around 2000, I think. But resistance does exist. Another very important, as we talked about at the top there, inspecting the transplants. Don't put anything into the yard that's going to be uh, potentially infected. And I think we're safe now, but delaying the planting will help the violets and, uh, I'm sorry, the violas and the pansies along so that they're not suffering from the hot weather at the same time they're trying to fight off a Calaviopsis infection. What makes this particularly nasty is the fact that it produces, the fungus Calaviopsis basicola, it produces these clematospores that will ensure its survival in the soil. And that is a wonderful segue into the spiel that I wanted to do about how pathogens survive the winter. Picture from campus a couple of winters ago. And there are several places where this can occur. But the most important is in the soil. And we're generally talking about root and crown pathogens here, sometimes vascular wilt pathogens. And a few of the many examples are bacterial diseases such as crown gall and southern bacterial wilt caused by Ralstonia solanaceum, which we have talked about in past programs. There are a number of fungi and fungus-like organisms that can survive in the soil, including Sclerotium rolfsii, whose sclerotia are pictured here on the right, the small little beads there that allow it to survive in the absence of a host and under unfavorable conditions. Phytophthora, of course, survives in the soil, Phalaviopsis, which we just mentioned. And there are nematode diseases, or the nematodes themselves, that survive in the soil, including root knot, but not exclusively root knot. It was interesting to read that uh, root knot nematodes produce two different kinds of egg masses, white and brown. And the brown ones, uh, I'll steal an entomology term here, have uh, or exhibit diapause and won't hatch immediately, but ensure that some of the eggs will be around for the following season to produce the juveniles that then infect the plant roots. In plant pathology, we like to talk about soil inhabitants as different from soil invaders. 
Now this is just an, an illustration. It's not actually based on uh, numbers or data, but to give you the idea, the soil invaders are the ones which would, when the host is gone, very quickly die off. So after a couple of years, the population crashes in the soil, and you're safe to replant again. So that's something or a situation where rotation is an effective strategy for dealing with a disease. The soil inhabitants, on the other hand, are those that, because of their resistance structures or their ability to live off of dead organic matter or their wide host range, for some reason they're hanging into the soil a, a longer period of time and rotation is going to be less effective or ineffective against soil inhabiting pathogens. But the soil invaders, oftentimes, they are associated with dead plant tissue. And so that once that tissue has decayed, then the population is dead and you don't have to worry about uh, new infections. Some of the famous examples of diseases or pathogens, excuse me, that survive on dead plant tissue include apple scab, bacterial spot of zinnia, Black rot of crucifers, which is a bacterial disease also. Black spot of rose, a fungus of course. And another fungus, daily leaf streak. Again, these are not the only ones, but just a few examples. Which brings us to the perennial reminder of not putting diseased plants into the compost pile. If you're doing it right and you've got good heating in there, that will probably knock pathogens back, but why do you want to start with uh, disadvantage of having diseased plants in there in the first place. All right, pathogens can also spend the winter on living plants, either conspicuously or inconspicuously. Some of the conspicuous ones are Entomosporium leaf spot, which you've probably seen on India hawthorn in the cooler months. Some canker diseases that have obvious cankers on stems during the entire year and fire blight. If those dead shoots and cankers have not been pruned out, that's a good way for the fire blight organism to survive the winter. In other cases, the infection is not as conspicuous. Exobacidium leaf gall that forms those big fleshy white uh, galls in the spring is right now hiding very subtly in the buds of the infect or infected buds of camellias and azaleas and rhododendrons in some cases waiting to come out next spring. Powdery mildew can do the same thing. Spot anthracnose of dogwood, which is all over us in the spring, where is it now? Well, it's in infected twigs and even infected fruit. And finally, probably uh, one of the most famous of all, cedar apple rust, but many people may not be aware that that first winter, in other words, the juniper twigs that were infected this spring, are not going to be showing symptoms. That gall will develop next summer and then produce spores the following spring, the spring of 2012. Plant diseases can live, I'm sorry, pathogens can live systemically within plants as well. Virus diseases such as rose rosette, which has now been proven to be a virus, by the way, if you hadn't heard the news, and bacterial scorch, xylella fastidiosa, which will live in a, systemically in an, effect, in an infected plant, an oak tree in this case, and return year after year as the plant resumes growth. Plant pathogens can hang out in weeds. Probably most famously uh, for us would be tomato spotted wilt virus. Hangs out in the weeds in the wintertime, and then when we plant our tomatoes or peppers or tobacco or peanuts, the thrips vectors will bring it into the crop as they move away from the weed hosts in the spring. Cupelumber mosaic virus can have a similar phenomenon, with different vectors, in that case it's aphids. And hollyhock rust will infect malva, uh, mallows, uh, cheeses, they're sometimes called, that particular weed. I don't know for sure that this is an overwintering mechanism in North Carolina, though. And of course, you want on your hollyhocks, keep those dead infected leaves cleaned up, because that's another way that it can survive from year to year. A few, fortunately few, diseases are able to uh, continue from year to year on seeds. Some of these pathogens will survive either in or on seeds. And examples of these include 
bacterial fruit lots of watermelon, bacterial spot on tomato and pepper, black rot of crucifers, and even tomato mosaic virus. Fortunately, the seed companies are doing their quality control to make sure that we don't buy problems from them. However, some people save their own seed, and it's something that they should keep in mind as well. And finally, there are a few plant pathogens that just can't cut it here in the wintertime and will spend their winters in warmer climates. Downy mildew cucurbits is probably the most famous one for this particular audience. This is not a systemic downy mildew like the one on sunflower, but uh, forms these angular, first yellow, then dead spots on different cucurbits. It can't survive the winter, so it hangs out in South Florida, warm places like that. It's been found there in, even in February on cucurbit crops there and spreads on wind currents northward uh, when we have the crop available. Some rust diseases do the same thing, such as soybean rust, famously, that spends the winter on kudzu in the Gulf states. So then with uh, the things that Dave has talked about and that I have mentioned here, you know that your pests and pathogens are ready for the winter. Are you? Some tasks in the yard and the garden that still may have to be done. I saw on the computer this morning that it was snowing in Aspen, Colorado, so there is hope. And with that, I'll take you, uh, take any questions. I see Julie has one. If time, what do entomologists attribute to the lower populations of fire ants this year? I'll have to turn that over to an entomologist. Okay, I believe we actually uh, discussed this uh, <coughs> the uh, last time, a couple months ago. And in the last few months, I've started to notice uh, fire ant mounds popping up here and there, but still in not nearly the numbers I saw them last year. And although I don't have a, a certain answer, my, my best suspicion is that the unusually consistently cold February we had this past year, even though it wasn't severely cold, the consistent cold may have kept the fire ants from being able to forage for an entire month there, and they may have simply starved out for the most part. Uh, again, I don't know if that's the answer, but it's the it's one answer that would explain why this, this phenomenon occurred over a very wide area of the state and not just a, a local occurrence. All right, the question, by saving your own seed, how do you protect from plants, pests, and pathogens? Well, um, from, from plants, of course, make sure that you don't get weed seed mixed in there. For uh, insect pests, I probably wouldn't have a good answer there. For plant pathogens, know, the first thing is to know if there are any diseases that are seed transmitted in your particular crop. For example, uh, tomatoes and peppers, you want to worry about bacterial spot and also possibly about tomato uh, mosaic virus. So in the case of the bacterial diseases, there are some Clorox or chlorine bleach type treatments that can be used. They have to be done carefully, timing and concentration to make sure you don't kill the seed, but that will uh, help to knock those back. I don't have the exact details off the top of my head. There are also for tobacco mosaic, tomato mosaic virus, some phosphate solutions that can be used to inactivate those on the surface of seed. Uh, again, you can look those up online. I don't happen to know the details. And of course, the most important thing, don't save seed from diseased plants. Make sure you choose your seed from healthy plants. How can we find Indian bread and wild not in sheds? I don't know because they are subterranean. Uh, I could only guess if you see a pine stump with why well, brown cubicle rot, you could try digging in the area and see if you could find them. Uh, somebody commenting here that they think that the formula for Clorox seed treatment is in the Ag Chem manual. That could be. I, I don't remember seeing it there, but I'm sure it's available online somewhere. OK, thanks, Mike. OK, thanks, Mike. We have a couple of things coming up on the, the schedule. And there's uh, links here to two calendars that are online that are places that you can both advertise events that you want to see um, going to the public, and you can see other things that are uh, happening in the state. Uh, there's a Master Gardener Association meeting on the 16th in, in Brunswick County, and the Carolina Farm Steward Association conference is coming up. 
You may also want to um, mark your calendar now for May 9th through the 11th will be the Master Gardener Conference this year. It will be in Raleigh. So I hope you're planning on coming to that. Just a heads up that um, with Almanac Gardener and In the Garden with Bryce Lane, both of those are available online as podcasts. And so you can, even when their program's not running, you can still be in touch with that. I want to ask that, that you take a minute to reflect on, on the way that the program is set up. We're getting ready to plan for next year. So I would really love to have your feedback on the, you know, the components that are included in the program, you know, the, the agent section, the special guest section, and the insect and plant pathology sections. Um, any suggestions that you have for improving that for, for next year, and also any topics that you would like to see covered next year, um, so that we, as we're looking for, and if you have recommendations about speakers that we should, should recruit, or topics that you'd like to see included, please send those to me uh, and include them on your evaluation in the LMS system, too. OK, let's see. There's a, we have an invasion of mimosa weed this summer. Any feedback? Anybody have suggestions on an invasion of mimosa weed? No weed scientists in the program today, so we'll have to. That might be something that we should include in the program ne next year. Would be uh, a weed section. All right. Um, happy to take comments and suggestions now live. Also happy to get your emails and and your feedback on the um, LMS system. <laughs> Deal with your mimosa by cutting down your neighbor's mimosa tree. Where is the evaluation form? There, the there's an L the learning management system that the agents are in includes an evaluation that's a part of that. Um, I think that that we may be putting together an a, an online evaluation that we'll send out both to to ask agents to send to master gardeners as well as fill out themselves. Okay, there's my email. Oops. Okay, let me put my email address up there so that if you want to send it um, directly to me, you can can send a message to me. I uh, want to thank all of the people who were a part of, of putting it together. We had fabulous speakers all year. Steve Bambera is kind of the, kind of the backbone of, of organizing and managing this event. Our steady stars, Mike <laughs> Munster and Dave Steppen, have just really gone above and beyond in getting great images, getting the slides done with all of the names. That was the feedback that we got a year ago that you guys really wanted the names typed out, both the, the common name and the botanical or, or uh, scientific names. And they've gone to a lot, a lot of effort to, to do just that. Um, and Lee Jay has saved us over and over and over again. Many, many thanks, Lee Jay. All right, well, we will look forward to seeing, seeing you next year. Uh, and we'll get those, the dates out to you um, when we, as soon as we get them set. <laughs>